We are living in a very special time in our understanding of the universe and our place in that universe. To explain to you, let me first provide some historical context. One of the great accomplishments of 20th century astronomy was our ability to understand how stars work, how they shine, how they burn so hot and for so long. And it's only been, in fact, in the last 70 years that we really understand the inner working of the stars. Now, this is really quite an amazing development when you consider that for over a century, we've had automobiles, light bulbs, plastics, even birth control, all these things we had before we understood how the stars worked. But that was the last century. I want to talk to you about this century, not the 20th century, but the 21st century, and what I see as one of the major endeavors of astronomy today, and that is the study of extrasolar planets, planets around other stars. This is an incredibly important topic because if we can unlock the secrets of the planets, how they form and their hidden lives, then we can also understand perhaps our own place in the universe better. Let me start with a brief tour of our own solar system. As many of you know, our solar system has eight major planets, four rocky planets on the outside, of which Earth is one of them, and then four gas giant planets uh, on the, I'm sorry, four rocky planets on the inside, and then four gas giant planets on the outside. In addition to these planets, there are many small rocky bodies in the solar system. Between the orbits of Mars uh, and Jupiter, uh, there are many, many asteroids, bodies from hundreds of miles in diameter down to very small particles, leftovers from the planet formation process. Moving further out, beyond the orbit of Neptune, farther than three billion miles from the Sun, there lies the Kuiper Belt, of which one of the largest members we know is now the former planet, Pluto. The Kuiper Belt also, many small rocky bodies, many thousands known now, icy as well, so cold and so dark out there. In addition to our own planets, in the last 15 years, there's been an amazing revolution in the discovery of planets around other stars. And the plot on the right is one illustration. It shows a plot of the distance of those planets versus their mass. Over 500 such planets now discovered to date. So there's been a wonderful uh, cornucopia of planet discoveries in over a decade. Now the problem lies in the fact that in our own solar system and even these uh, planets that we see around other stars, all the action is over. We know from the geologic record of rocks here on the Earth and also meteorites that fall from space that the Earth and the solar system formed almost five billion years ago. So everything that happened in the beginning, how it all came together, has all since been lost. It's buried back in time. Now, there's a great quote by George Eliot that I like on this topic, and she wrote, men, like planets, have both a visible and an invisible history. The visible history is what we see all around us. The planets in our own solar system, the rocky asteroids and Kuiper Belt objects that are left over, the planets around old stars that we're now finding by the dozens and hundreds. But it's the invisible history that we're really interested in. Where did this all come from, and how did it all come together? And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. We can answer these questions here from even our lonely vantage point here in the Pacific Ocean. This, of course, is the big island of Hawaii. The two snow-covered caps show the mountains of Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is the highest peak in the entire Pacific Basin at 14,000 feet. It is the site, probably, of the best ground-based astronomy in the entire world. It's a unique location. The island uh, in the Pacific, surrounded by a large body of thermally stable water, the site is very dark, of course. There's minimal developments on the Big Island, and the civic authorities do a good job of controlling the lighting development. And also, the site is extremely dry. All these uh, properties are very beneficial for conducting ground-based astronomy. And so, over the last 40 years, a network of telescopes has sprung up on the summit of Mauna Kea, starting with a telescope built by the University of Hawaii. It was appreciated that this was a, a unique and amazing site for astronomy. And so uh, international organizations, universities, and governments have built uh, more than a dozen telescopes now on the summit of Mauna Kea. And here's an aerial view of the many telescopes on the mountain. Of course, this is not a representative view. Uh, we're astronomers, so we don't work during the day. We work at night. And at night, every night here on the, um, on the Big Island of Hawaii, these telescopes are in operation, scanning the heavens, figuring out some piece of our cosmic origins. And in their, in their way, every telescope has contributed to this story of where we came from, that I will share with you a small piece. Now, you can see from this image, you see star trails on the sky. 
due to the Earth's rotation. It's a long exposure photograph, and most of these stars are not interesting to us for this question because they are old. They're billions of years old. They're stars, many of them just like the sun, very old, and the story is all over. What we need to do is we need to identify the few stars in the sky that are very young, ages perhaps of only a few million years. This is just a blink in the history of the planetary systems where the planets and the planetary systems are still coming together. So this is our time machine. We use telescopes to identify those special stars that are like the sun, and we watch the movie as it is beginning to unfold. Now, it's a very difficult problem. Uh, the stars are very faint, their planets are even fainter, and they're very distant. Um, that's why we need telescopes at spectacular sites. Uh, on the summit of Mauna Kea, um, two of the telescopes are the Keck telescopes. They are the largest optical infrared telescopes in the world. They've been in operation for almost two decades now. Keck is unique in that the mirror is so large, it's 33 feet across or more, that it cannot be made out of a single piece of glass. In fact, it's 36 hexagonal pieces put together like a jigsaw puzzle held in precision as the telescope tracks during the course of the night. And this is a view down the slit of the telescope where you can see the hexagonal outline of the primary mirror. So you need a large telescope. Stars are very distant, planets are very faint, you need to collect as much light as possible, but that's not enough. Turns out that if you put a small amateur telescope on the summit of Mauna Kea, it makes exactly the same quality images as the Keck telescope, which is many tens of times bigger. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the Earth's atmosphere, which we love so much as people, is an incredible detriment to us as astronomers. It's ever turbulent. You know this. You know that when you look out over a hot road on a summer's day, the images in the distance appear to dance and twirl, and that's because um, there is hot air, turbulent air above the street, which is bending the light. And in the same fashion, at night, from the summit of Mauna Kea, the atmosphere above us, although it's very tenuous because the mountain is very high, it is also turbulent, ever turning over, ever distorting the light that we detect from distant stars and distant planets. Here's a movie which shows an example. On the left, if you were to take a very high-speed exposure, hundreds of times per second of a very bright star, this is what you would see. The star would break up into many, many small dancing dots, which we refer to as speckles. They correspond to small, coherent scales in the atmosphere that are ever turning over. So a large telescope is not enough. In the last decade, large telescopes like the Keck and other telescopes as well have been equipped with a new technology known as adaptive optics. It's basically a way in real time to fix the blurring of the Earth's atmosphere, essentially by changing the shape of a small mirror hundreds of times per second. And you can see on the right, these are the images corrected with adaptive optics. They're a lot better. The images are a lot tighter, 10 to 20 times better. It's not perfect, but still it's a major improvement. And so it's the combination of this very large collecting area this world-class observing site, and also the real-time correction provided by adaptive optics, which are the three tools that we need to study how the planets are born. Let me give you an example of how well this works. This is an image of the planet Neptune, okay, taken um, from the Keck with ordinary imaging, and you can see it's a big fuzzy blob with perhaps some bright patches. And if you use adaptive optics on it, you can see a level of detail which you'd never appreciated before. You can see clouds, you can see storms, and you can track their progress over time. To provide a more mundane example, um, if your own eyes could form images as sharp as the Keck telescope with adaptive optics. Um, here in Honolulu, here we are, uh, if you had a friend on the summit of Mauna Kea, if your eyes could make images so sharp, you would be able to see if your friend was wearing gloves or not. Okay? So truly uh, an incredible technological accomplishment to do this. But of course we're not interested in looking at gloves, we're interested in studying planets. And um, how do we do this? Well, we know that there are sites uh, hundreds of light years from Earth where stars are being born in great abundance. Tens, hundreds of thousands of stars coming into existence only a few million years old, surrounded by the primordial clouds of gas and dust out of which they formed. We know that these young stars, and here's a collection of stars in the constellation of Orion, um, we know that most of the stars are surrounded by very dense disks of gas and dust similar to those uh, disks of, in our, of material in our own solar system, but millions of times more dense. This is the primordial disk out of which planets are born. And this is an artist's conception. You can see many small particles, large rocks, and perhaps planets being put together. The challenge is, uh, for us as astronomers is not to be artists, but to, in fact to do these measurements. How do we do this? Well, it turns out that with a large telescope and adaptive optics, 
you can't normally see even the constituents of these young solar systems. For instance, asteroids um, are completely undetectable by large telescopes. But there's a trick. The particles, the bodies, the rocks, they collide. And over time, they grind themselves down into small bits of dust, smallest size, about a micron. A micron is smaller than the thickness of, your, uh, of a hair on your head. These micron-sized particles, although they're very small, they're extremely efficient at scattering light. Consider, for instance, if I had a piece of chalk. If you were to look at that piece of chalk, it's a small, solid object. But if I were to pulverize that piece of chalk and throw it into the air, you would be able to see that dust cloud from much farther away. So in the same way, these small dust particles are our little mirrors, basically, to see what's going on in these solar systems, even though we have a hard time seeing the larger bodies. So we've done this. Oh, before we do that, let me show you. Actually, uh, this phenomenon exists here in our own solar system. This is an image of the zodiacal light. It's a band of dust clouds, uh, of small dust particles in the orbit of the Earth that you can see on a very, very dark night in the plane of the, uh, of the zodiac. Now, around young stars, this zodiacal light can be a million times denser. And that, combined with large telescope, combined with adaptive optics, is what we seek to detect. Here's an example. It's a young star known as AU Mic. It's one of the very youngest, nearest stars to Earth in the process we think of forming planets. What you see is an edge-on disk of material. It's larger than the size of the solar system, as shown by the ellipse at the bottom, six billion miles uh, in diameter. Small dust grains, all the size of a micron or so, scattering light from the central star, the central star has been blotted out and is shown as a represent, representation here. The amazing thing when we made this image was not that we were able to see the disk, which pleased us greatly, but the fact that if we looked very carefully, in fact, the disk was not completely smooth. If we looked very closely, we could, in fact, see lumps in the disk. Now, this is a surprise because normally a, a disk of materials under the influence of the gravity of the star simply goes in a very steady orbit, like a record player, basically. There's been more evidence of this. This is a, a new result from astronomer Carol Grady from the Subaru Telescope on the summit of Mauna Kea. It's a different young star. Um, and what you see here is um, now the disk is seen uh, from the top, face on. And you can see not only is there a disk of material, but there are also spiral arms. Okay? A very surprising finding. There's some kind of structure that's holding up the dust in these disks. How does this work? This shows a computer simulation. What you see is a star, a disk of dust, and then you also see a planet. The planet is the small yellow dot going in elliptical orbit around the star. The dust feels the gravity from both the star and the planet and is carved into shapes that we would otherwise not see. In this case, we see lumps. Okay, So these asymmetries, these lumps, these strange morphological structures that we see in disks are a great indication that there are planets in there even though we can't detect the planets themselves. But we can do better. In a few special cases, we can actually see the planets themselves. To do this, we have to look at the extremely young stars, where the planets themselves are just basically newly born. They're very hot. They're very luminous. Here's an example, which you may have seen in uh, last week's paper. Um, this is a young star. Here's the disk of material, again, imaged from a telescope here on Mauna Kea. This star, we know, has an absence of material. It has a hole in the middle. And very careful imaging by uh, University of Hawaii astronomer Adam Krauss has shown this. Now to you, this just looks like a red blob and a blue blob, okay? <laughs> but to me, this is a very exciting measurement. <laughs> All right. That's why I'm the astronomer, okay? What you see is you see the thermal emission, the heat from a young planet captured at the time of its formation, only two million years after it was born. The planet is still being assembled, and it's unusually hot and unusually red, okay? It's a marvelous measurement of a planet in its youngest stages. And what do we think is happening? Well, here's an artist's conception, is we think, again, there's this very dense disk of dust and gas, which has now been cleared out in the middle, okay? The planet has begun to carve out some of the material, and itself is still in the process of coming together. An even more spectacular example, this is a young star known as HR8799, discovered um, by Christian Merois and his collaborators, again, using telescopes on Mauna Kea. Not a single planet, but a four-planet system, the only multiple-planet system to date imaged outside the solar system. Each of these planets has a mass of about five to ten times the mass of Jupiter. And over the course of several years, we've actually been able to watch the planets move. And so we can see they actually orbit the star all in the same direction, again, like a record player, like we see in our own solar system. 
Okay? This has turned out to be an incredibly rich laboratory for understanding how planetary systems form. To give you a sense of scale, here's the solar system, and here is uh, the 8799 system. It's much larger. The planets are more massive, okay? five to ten times the mass of Jupiter. And it also has um, dust clouds in the system which are under the influence of the planets. It's an even more remarkable system because uh, you can, uh, with uh, working with the University of Hawaii graduate student Brendan Bowler, we've been actually able to take a spectrum of the planet. And what I mean by spectrum is we've been able to essentially measure the color of light coming off the planet, so we're not just taking a picture, but we're trying to decipher what the atmosphere of the planet is made out of. And in this case, we were searching for the molecule methane, which we know is very abundant in the planet Jupiter, but we did not detect methane in 8799b. And this was a surprise, and it tells us the atmospheric chemistry of the planet is probably different than the gas giant planets in our own solar system. Now, it sounds like from this description that we've done quite a lot, but in fact, what I've shown you are the small handful of objects that we've actually been able to discover very well. Okay? The challenge to us is to be able to build a much larger census of planets at the time they are forming and to study their properties. And there's hope on the horizon. There's a telescope known as the 30-meter telescope to be built on the summit of Mauna Kea in the next decade. Its mirror will be at more than 100 feet across. That's about the wingspan of a Boeing 737. Okay, three times the size of the Keck telescope, 10 times the light gathering power. It will create ever sharper images with its very precise adaptive optic system and will allow us to stu study even more young planetary systems, even more young planets, and to measure their composition through spectroscopy than we're able to do now. Finally, uh, to conclude, uh, let me wrap up with a simple picture here of an astronomer on the summit of Mauna Kea. After the end of a long night of observing, it's dawn, it's the start of a new day. In the same way, I think that we are now on the verge of a start, the dawn, of a new understanding of our place in the universe. In the same way that the last century we were able to unlock the secrets of the stars, in this coming century, and I fa in fact, I think even much sooner, perhaps in the next decade, we'll be able to unlock the secrets of the planets. We'll be able to identify how they form. We'll be able to say how common they occur in the universe. Are they frequent or are they very rare? And in that way, we will be able to understand much better our place in this universe. Thank you.